We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we've got a question from patron Brian Sheen, who wrote, My question was prompted by a comment Sean some time ago regarding historical games. Being a longtime historical miniature gamer, what historical-themed board games would you recommend for those of us used to a more complex game experience? Well, thank you very much for the comment, Brian, and for being one of our hotel guest Patreon patrons. I hope we got the name right this time, Sheehan. I think that's right. Well, practice makes perfect, especially with some helpful pokes in Discord to let us know we got it wrong. Yeah, we do apologize for our pronunciation names. Please feel free to correct us. Now, I know Brian is the secretary of the Northwest Historical Miniature Gaming Society. This is a group that plays and takes very historic miniature gaming and everything that goes with that from the recreationist rules to the miniature painting and scenery building and all those aspects. Now, I'll admit this is an aspect of the tabletop hobby that I have not really gotten into myself. Now, I have played a number of miniature games over the years. I do enjoy painting, building miniatures, as well as scenery. I've always stuck with fantasy and sci-fi themes and, well, lighter rule sets. and None of the real simulationist type stuff. Now, I do hold a lot of respect, though, for people who play historical games, especially those with an eye to accuracy and simulation. Indeed, it's a hobby that can really take in a lot of different specialities, not only gaming, but with model making, painting, and researching aspects. In some ways, it reminds me of the same sort of mindset that gets people into the SCA or uh, historical battle recreations uh, out in the fields. You know, the actual uh, mm -hmm. people who take part in live recreations just on a different physical scale. Yeah, I totally agree. Actually, one of the, the local gamers, no longer local, was part of recreation of um, War of 1812 stuff out at Fort Malden. Was also a Tyranid player at Warhammer 40k. So I think there is some overlap for the with the recreationists and the hobbyists. Now, where I don't have a lot of historical miniature gaming experience, I do think I have a pretty good amount of historical board gaming experience. And that works out well, since that's what Brian's looking for tonight. Now, note, I am not going to be talking about Hex Encounter chip-based war games tonight. Hex Encounter Wargaming is a genre of games all on its own, in my opinion, and one I have even less experience with than miniature gaming. Games like Advanced Squad Leader, the standard combat series from Miniature Men Press, Combat Commander, SPQR from GMT Games. There are thousands of these out there. I personally don't know enough about these games to actually make any recommendations here. So what I will be talking about are the more traditional hobby board games, uh, your Euro games, some of your Meritrash games, and some war games. Like some of these have war game roots. None of these involve figuring out ratios, counting your chit stats, and having to look up things on combat tables. Right. If your game requires a three-ring binder or a spreadsheet, we probably won't be covering it here tonight. The one exception are the train games may actually fall in there somewhat. That's about as close as we get. So my number one recommendation, now this is based on personal experience, the games I've had the most fun with is the Command and Colors series of games. These are all written by one man, Richard Borg. And there are a number of these set at different time periods with varying amounts of historical accuracy. Now, on the heavier end of things, we're going to stick to, so that's what Brian was looking for, is the, the, the more epic, engaging games. Uh, your best bet is going to be looking at the ones that specifically say Command and Colors on the box. So, like, there are, like, Battle Cry is a Command and Colors game set during the Civil War. I'm not talking about that one. Not that that's a terrible game, but I'm looking for the ones that specifically say Command and Colors. Those are Command and Colors Ancient, Command and Colors Napoleonics, Command and Colors Medieval, and Command and Colors Samurai Battle, specifically. All of these use blocks on a hex map to represent units. The blocks are two-sided, like there's no fog of war or anything, it's just blocks represent your minis, so way simpler than having to paint anything. And you have groups of blocks, and as units are destroyed, you remove them. And it uses a really unique card-driven mechanic, which is the command system, where your board is divided into three zones. You have a center and left and right flanks, and you're going to play cards that say things like, use two units on the right flank or activate one unit per per area or activate three units on the flank and then the units are color coded usually red blue and green and it might say activate your green units activate your red units activate your blue units and the combat dice have those colors on them now some games mean if you roll the color of the unit you're attacking with you hit other ones are if you roll the unit you're trying to hit you hit and so on but they're all variations of the same scene 
big hexes, lots of blocks, card driven with some dice resolution system. And that was the Command and Color series of games. Up next, I have a series of games that also use blocks. This is the Columbia block games. These are from a number of distant designers, and these, again, have wooden blocks on a map, but they're very different from the Command and Color series. For one, some are hex-based, but most are route maps, where you have points with lines dividing them, usually cities and roads, but it depends on the particular game you're playing. What these feature is a fog of war. This is created by having unit information only on one side of each block, and you play with your blocks facing you and the opponent's blocks facing the other. Actually, um, for a mass market version, think Stratego, but on a higher level. In addition to having the stats on all one side, the stats on the blocks change during the game, which is represented by rotating the blocks 90 degrees. Normally, it's a matter of your units come out at full strength, and every time they take damage, you rotate them clockwise 90 degrees, and their stats change. Though some of the games do have rules for reinforcements and uh, merging units, and in that case, you turn counterclockwise. The two most well-known Columbia block games, historically speaking, because I do do some fantasy as well, my favorite being Hammer of the Scots, which does the whole um, Britain versus William Wallace Braveheart thing, um, and Julius Caesar, which does the whole Julius Caesar versus Pompey Roman thing. And those are the Columbia block games. It's sticking with the war game theme. Next, I have the Birth of series from Academy Games. Again, uh, there's a few different designers on this one, but they're all published by the same publisher, Academy Games. These are what we call folk on a map games or cube on a map games. These have the Birth of America series was the first series they put out. They include three games. 1754 Conquest, 1775 Rebellion, and my personal favorite, 1812 Invasion of Canada. These, there's also a new series that they released just starting off, uh, I think it was 2018, might be 2019, the Birth of Europe series has launched, but so far they've only put out the first game in the series, it's 878 Vikings. No, 878 Vikings did change them from, they always called these cubes on a map games, well 878 Vikings did switch them for little miniatures, not the kind you want to paint, more just better representations than cubes, which just bugs me because I want to call them cubes on a map games, but technically they're no longer cubes. I love this series, um, especially a high player counts. Now, all of these games are team-based games. You always have two factions, but there are multiple players on each faction. And yes, you can play them two-player, but you don't get the full experience without having multiple players on each side, each controlling a different faction that's part of that side during whatever war is being recreated. This is another card-driven game, and this one is not about destroying the enemy units as much as holding Q points on the map. And generally, at the end of every round, you're going to get points for holding so many much things on the map. Or at the end of the game, the player that holds the most points on a map is going to win. So, for example, 1812, when the game ends, it's whoever owns more territory in the opponent's land than the other person who wins. There's actually a really unique mechanic for the way the game ends in this, where you have to play the cards in your hands. And one of those cards eventually is going to be a peace card. And once all players on one side call for peace, the game ends in a true because that's how most actual wars end up ending. What I like about it, though, is sometimes you're forced to do it because it's the only card you have left, even though you may be on the losing side. It's a really neat mechanic. Also has a really neat initiative system where it randomizes who goes every turn. Huge fan of the Birth of series from Academy Games. Right. And that was the Birth of America and Birth of Europe series from Academy Games. All right, that's an awful lot of war and battles. So we're going to we're going to move away from that and bring up a rather popular, very heavy set of games that may just be what Brian's looking for if you want something more involved and deeper and almost a lifestyle style game just like historical miniatures and that is the 18xx series of train games. Now, as the name is implied, most of these games are set sometime during the 1800s. Uh the the birth of the age of steam right the the age of rail and robber barons there are a ton of different 18xx games spread over various time periods some more historically accurate than others each game has its own map and its own set of special rules but it's all about owning stocks and various rail companies upgrading those companies buying trains and building routes the winner of every single 18xx game is the one that has the biggest the best portfolio by the end of the game the interesting thing here is no one owns a particular 
color or a particular train, unlike most Euro games or say even like, a, well, uh, uh, Ticket to Ride actually is a better example of an 18xx. So you don't own it. You have your own route. But say like a Steam or something like that. In this case, it, you are buying stocks in the companies instead of playing one company. Right. And now if you, and for, for instance, on how involved these are, if you go to a con, if, if in-person cons happen again, 18xx jet, uh, games get their own rooms often mm -hmm. and, and people will lock themselves in there for hours at a time. Yes. And those are the 18xx series of train games. All right, back to the war theme, but this time cooled down quite a bit. We are going to talk about the one game that I am sure everyone expected to find on this list tonight, and that is Twilight Struggle. Uh, this is a game that sat at the top of the Board Game Geek number one spot for almost 10 years. When I joined Board Game Geek in 2002, this was the number one game in the world. This is a two-player only card-driven area control game that is all about the U.S. and Russian Cold War. And the space race happening at the same time. That's actually a big part of the game. Players are using cards to influence various factions around the world, various um, regions of the world, while trying to avoid mutual destruction through thermal nuclear war. Yes, that is a common outcome in a game of Twilight Struggle. Uh, this is still considered by many people to be the best two-player board game ever made. Strong recommend check this one out. And that is Twilight Struggle. All right, taking things a different look. Now, I am not sure if you can consider these to be historical. I'm going to go with it because these are civilization building games. Because the good civilization building games do feature actual historic events, monuments, wonders, technological advances, and people in them. So while you may not be following a historic timeline, you're rearranging historic elements to build your own civilization. While there are a number of good civ games out there, including Sid Meier's Civilization, the modern version, as well as the classic Avalon Hill Civilization and Advanced Civilization, my personal favorite is much more modern, and that is Through the Ages, A New Story of Civilization. This is a card-driven brain burner of a game that will take multiple plays to master. Once you do, though, it is a fantastic experience. Now, I know some people that want a Civ game to have a map and exploration in it, so don't like Through the Ages or Nations, another card game. If you do really have to have those like miniatures and moving and building buildings and physically that, that, that aspect of it, where you're flipping over map tiles, then take a look at Clash of Cultures. And that was civilization building games like Through the Ages and Clash of Cultures. And Through the Ages is definitely up there on the uh, the weight. I don't even know what its uh, board game weight is. I haven't actually checked. I mean, but I guess I, like a 3.8, but uh, I'm not, yeah, I don't know offhand. It is a, a, a hunk of a card game that, that really, yeah. We, we you got to play a few yeah, times. We should, we, even, even playing a few times, it takes, <laughs> uh, you know, there's a lot of aspects to that one. All right, this one is going to be a catch-all. I, I wasn't sure a good way to list these games together, and I'm not quite sure if these are going to be quite what Brian's looking for, but I'm going to call this section Gaming the Renaissance because there are a number of very solid Euro games set during the Renaissance based on various historical events and families. Uh, some of the best include the Princes of Florence, where you are building a dynasty like the Borgia or the Medici. Uh, you can play merchants and traders in the city of Genoa, or Coimbra for the older one. The other ones were a little older. Uh, Coimbra is a much more modern game set in the 15th, 16th century Portugal. This uses multi-use dice mechanic that is really well done. Or Lorenzo Il Magnifico from Cool Mini or Not is a very popular one that was just released last year. There are tons of these Renaissance themed games. Like we could probably do a best renaissance games episode and talk about which are more historic or not so again these range on the heavy scale these are all, all mid-weight or heavier but may not be the big epic game that brian's looking for or might just be what is perfect for his game night and those were euro games set during the renaissance period and i i just hope lorenzo Il magnifico is better in person than it was it's supposed to be amazing because digitally it was a <laughs> tragedy yeah, it's supposed to be amazing. I'll admit I have not played that one. 
All right. Uh, this one wasn't on my list until about two hours before the show when Deanna was like, did you put this on the list? Did you put that on the list? Did you put this on the list? And then I got to give her thanks because she's the one that likes the heavier Euro games. And what she brought up were all the non-Renaissance Euro style games that we own that are fantastic. Um, these go from like Catan. Settlers of Catan, everyone knows and will love. There are a number of historical scenarios that were put out. One where you're building the pyramids of Cheop, or another where you're following the travels of Alexander the Great. Uh, Deanna's favorite game at the time, for one, a long time, may still be, I have to check with her, is Trajan, which is a Roman-themed game where you were playing the Emperor Trajan, or Tribune or Carpe Diem from Stefan Feld. They're all Roman-themed games. It doesn't have to always be so military either. For example, Arkwright is based on the invention of automation in the automotion, or sorry, automation industry and the build of industry in the U.S. with the invention of the spinning jenny. Lisboa is all about the fires in Portugal and rebuilding after those. There are so many great historic Euro games. Again, this could probably be a standalone topic. And I got to say, Brian, if you're looking for specific recommendations, hit me up on the Discord and I can probably give you specific ones. But there's just far too many for us to list them all here. Those are other Euro games with historic <laughs> themes. That's, that's actually not that terrible a taste to break because um, I only have one more section I want to talk about. These, just to, to get something different, I wanted to feature a couple of cooperative games. Now, these, to me, are pretty much the complete opposite of a two-sided historical miniature battle where you're at each other's throats and rolling hundreds of dice and trying to conquer the enemy. Uh, so this might be an interesting twist, something different for Brian to try out, something completely on the other side of gaming, uh, and that's cooperative historical games. So the number one most well-known, most referenced historical cooperative game would be Freedom the Underground Railroad. This is from Academy Games, which we mentioned before. Uh, this is a game which one to four players are working with the abo abolitionist movement to help bring an end to slavery in the United States. This is a multi-award winning game, a ridiculous number of awards that is now being used in history classes in schools. Like when you purchase this game, if you buy it at least from Academy Games, you can even order the teaching guide to go with the game so that you can get all the background information on how to best use the game to teach yourself and others about history. Now, the second cooperative game I want to list tonight is The Grizzled. Uh, this is a little lighter than the rest of the games on the list. This is a hand management card game all about trying to survive in the trenches of World War I. This is a brutal but enjoyable co-op experience that similar to Freedom the Underground Railroad won a slew of awards for innovation, gameplay, and thematic elements. Now, for that one in particular, if you are looking for the Grizzled, I do recommend trying to find the newer Armistice Edition, um, which adds a campaign element and does offer more of a sliding difficulty scale because the original game can be brutally hard. So you start off a little easier to get used to the game and getting your game group used to playing it before you ramp up the difficulty. Plus, as pre-painted miniatures, it looked really cool. Oh, well, those were two historical cooperative games Freedom, the Underground Railroad, and The Grizzled. All right, before we stop in and check with the lobby to see if they have anything, I do have three honorable mentions I want to highlight. Now, from what I saw online doing research for this topic, these are three of the most popular historical games out there. And the only reason they're on the list is I haven't played any of them. I don't know much about them. I don't own them. Now, I will admit, I have not played my copy of Freedom of the Underground Railroad, but I have read, at least read the rules, so I'm familiar with the game and I can see it's writing. These I know very little about. Just while doing research today, they popped up on multiple people's lists. The first is The Founding Fathers. Players play the Founding Fathers of America, competing to be the father with the most renown at the end of the game. They do this by going through articles of the Constitution one at a time and using multi-use delegate cards either to vote, to use for special abilities, or to support their stance on a number of different issues in the game. I didn't deep dive this, but this sounds like a heavy one with a ton of built-in history. And that was Founding Fathers. John Company, this was the heavy cardboard game of the year last year. This game attempts to sell the 250-year story of the British East India Company, one of the most well-known and influential organizations in all of world history. While attempting to steer the company, players will attempt to amass power, prestige, and position. This is a meaty 
looking game. Like I brought this up on Board Game Geek and the board intimidated me and that doesn't happen often. Like this is one of the busiest things I have ever seen and I'm not sure if it would fit on my 8x4 table downstairs. Plus you're trying to recreate 250 years of, of commercialism. That's just nuts. That That is an ambitious game. Plus Edward, a heavy cardboard, I trust his recommendations for him to give it the golden elephant. That is a huge accolade. And that was John Company. All right, the last one I left on the list is because it is probably the most infamous historically based game on the planet. While I don't know if it fits Brian's requirement of a complex game experience, you won't find a historically themed negotiation game as cutthroat or infamous as Diplomacy. Uh, this game's reputation for ruining friendships is why I've never played it. I have heard so many nasty things about this game. I, I have no interest in ever trying it. I don't want to give it a shot, but you know what? Some The people who love it, love it. Well, that's it for our discussion on historically themed board games. We're going to head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has anything to add. Uh, I see Danielle mentioned uh, <laughs> Tokaido. Uh, I don't know. I, that's, yeah, that's historic. That's, technically, yeah. Th yeah. That fits those historic, um, the historic Euro game series. Mm -hmm. Um, do we have anything else that people think they should check out? I don't, I don't think our chat room's probably in the same position where they haven't played it that a lot. Many a lot of people games. real excited with some of your suggestions, some real love oh, for academy good. games out there. Apparently, 1812 is very, very expensive. There's something going on with academy games, you can't get 878 Vikings right now either. Oh, so interesting. I don't know what's going on if it's it's a worldwide pandemic thing if it's something else i honestly don't know um it looks like they might be doing a reprinting of all their games because i have now seen vikings with a new box size oh okay so i'm wondering if they might be doing another print run and changing it interesting so i i am not positive I don't pay that much for invasion of canada like it's good but right so Jeff is knowing if he had a partner or four for Invasion of Canada, I play. I will happily play that with you once this is done. Um, yeah, the, the thing is, there are a lot of lighter games, right? So he did ask for complex side, so I tried to go with the heavier yep. games. So like uh, Danielle is noting, Guillotine is a is a nice historically themed game. But yeah, that's a lighter one, one yep. that maybe they need to bring back. Yep. And uh, Angie Games, she is not recommending Roman Bingo. Yes, Rise of Augustus. Bastille, that's a good one. There's a there's a good Euro with a, a good historic theme. That was actually, that that's still one of the biggest hidden gems of 2020. Although I think it came out in 2019. Hidden gem <laughs> for us in 2020. Right. Actually, I got it in 2019 because that was, a, I'm getting messed up with what year it is anymore. Yeah, quarantine. Like, quarantine time, I was messed up on months. <laughs> now I don't even know what year it is. There are so many, like the, what actually happened earlier today is, um, we, we have been just putting out the review games in my pack drop here. For those of you who are listening to the podcast, when I record the show, we have uh, our office and I have a table back there and we pile up the games that we're talking about. Well, I've had there for the last few weeks of the review games are like, oh, we really should have piled up the games we're going to recommend. So then Deanna goes downstairs she's like, oh, you got Trajan, you got this, this. And I'm like, no, no, no. Oh, those are good. <laughs> oh, Quebec. That's another one we thought of. So Quebec is a game about building the city of Quebec that has a really unique um, system where there's four different aspects of the government and politics, and I, it, this shows how long it's been. And you put influence cubes in them, but then they cascade to the next section. So if you don't win the first section, they cascade to the next one. If they don't win that, they cascade. That one's really neat. So Quebec's another recommendation for, again, the Euro style. Right. Um, but yeah, not a lot from our chat, which is fair. Uh, hopefully we just gave them a whole bunch of games to try out which is totally fair. Maybe we just did our research this time. <laughs> I know I've, I've play tested a, uh, a historical Canadian game based on uh, an, a, a hist famous historical Canadian election, but oh, uh, that's, that one's still just in play testing uh, locally here in Hamilton. Uh, there are quite a few other um, historic U S politics games that, that came up on other people's lists, but not being American. I don't care. <laughs> like there, 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 I don't even, there's one called making of the president. And then there's, there's one about the, the Nixon administration. And it's just not my thing. Whereas the cold war is something I definitely lived through. So I understand when I get a Cuban missile crisis, what card, what that card's about or the war on drugs. Right. Oh, absolutely. All right. 